الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin by praising Allah uh, We praise Him We seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions Whomsoever Allah guides, there is no one to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is, is worthy of worship, and that Muhammad, he is Abdullah. That means he is the worshipper of God. And he is Rasulullah, which means that he is the messenger of God. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you. Today we have gathered to talk about someone who is very beloved to us and beloved to Allah. And that is our Prophet Isa ibn Maryam, who is more often known in English as Jesus Christ or Jesus the Son of Mary. And we have gathered here today to defend this Messenger of God against the lies and the distortions and the blasphemy that has been attributed to him about which he is absolutely free of those things that people have put in his mouth and have accused him of and have attributed to him but specifically we want to talk about today one particular aspect and that is the passion or the so-called passion of Christ. By the passion of Christ, we are referring to what, what is more commonly known as the Eucharist and the crucifixion. For the Roman Catholic, the essence of Christianity is the Eucharist and the crucifixion. And according to the Pauline doctrine, that is the doctrine of a man, some of them call St. Paul, who preached his own unique gospel, a gospel that was not the gospel of Jesus, who the disciples and the apostles knew, but he was a man who claimed to have received his own gospel, his own message from Jesus. That's what he claimed. And his message was something quite different as we are going to discover today from the message of the Messenger of God, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. And it has become widely recognized today amongst even non-Muslim scholars that there is early Christianity and there is Pauline Christianity. And that they are two quite distinct and different things. And that is one of the issues that we want to explore. But the point is that we want to emphasize 
is that Pauline Christianity or the gospel according to Paul, we could say, teaches that he believes in Christ crucified. The essence of the message of Paul is the belief in a crucified Christ. A Christ who is a type of semi-divine being, although Paul himself stops short of attributing complete divinity to Jesus. This is something, as we discover, is something that is attributed to Jesus over time. But he did attribute to Jesus a type of creative power. He attributed to Jesus an, a pre-existence along with, God, along with God. But he did not make Jesus equal with God. Making Jesus God and equal with God is something that happened later. Even Paul did not go that far. However, his message was a message of a human being, a, pre, a human being who pre-existed with God, who had come to this earth, who had died, who had suffered, and who was crucified. And by accepting this sacrifice, and by accepting this death and sacrifice of Jesus, that was offered up by God, human beings could find salvation. And according to him, this is the only way that human beings could find salvation. By accepting the death and the crucifixion of Jesus as an atonement for the sins. And this is his claim. This is his message. Now I believe as every Muslim believes, and interestingly enough, there are many scholars and many people who also believe that that is not the message of Jesus himself. That is a message attributed to Jesus. And even I remember myself, when I was brought up a Roman Catholic, becoming aware of two completely different characters, we could say. Two different personalities. There was the Jesus I read about in the Gospel. This is the Jesus who walks and talks and breathes. This is the Jesus who was born. This is the Jesus who was circumcised. This is the Jesus who grew up. This is the Jesus who taught in the, in the temple. This is the Jesus who performed miracles in the name of God. And through the power of God. This is the Jesus who made himself clearly different from God. This is the Jesus who spoke and lived and acted as a human being. And this is the Jesus who taught a message. The message of this Jesus was a message about how to live. How we should relate to God and how we should relate to each other. This is a Jesus who stands and preaches what is called the Beatitudes. A beautiful series of statements where according to the Gospel narrative, Jesus is mentioning about the blessed people. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are just. Blessed are the poor. He is describing characteristics which human beings should acquire. And which they should display towards one another. When he is approached and when he is questioned about what people should believe, we never find him. We never find him expounding the Trinity. We never find him expounding in detail some mystical belief in a crucified Messiah whose blood sacrifice is going to absolve humanity of their sins. No, when he is being questioned, he talks about worshipping God. He says the sum of the law of the prophets is what? The Trinity? 
The crucifixion? No, he never talks about that. When he is asked to summarize the whole teaching of the prophets, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, the prophet sent to the children of Israel, he summarized it by saying, you should worship the Lord your God with all your hearts and all your soul, and you should love for your neighbor what you love for yourself. This is a teaching every single Muslim would be absolutely familiar with. Every Muslim would be familiar with this. Haqiqullah, haqiqul ibad. The rights of God and the rights of the creation. What we give to God is love. What we must give to God is love, but absolute love. Absolute love that requires absolute obedience. As Allah says in the Quran, Kul in kumtum tuhibban Allah, fatabiyuni yahbibkum Allah. If it is true that you love God. And in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there were people, Jews and Christians, and idol worshippers also claimed that they loved God. That they loved God. They claimed that. And God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad to say to these people, if it is true that you love God, then follow me. Then follow me. And then God will love you. There is a very similar thing that happens. An incident that happens that is narrated in the Gospels. A rich young man approaches Jesus and says to him, Good master, how shall I gain eternal life? Here it is. A perfect opportunity, you would think, for Jesus to explain to these people the Trinity. A perfect example, you would think, for Jesus to expound the doctrine that he's going to die on the cross for everybody's sins. But what does he say? He doesn't talk about that. When he's asked about eternal life and how to gain eternal life, he says and he expounds and he says to the man, Why do you call me good? There is only one who is truly good and that is God. Jesus, here, let alone attributing divinity to himself, denies even that he is good in the way that God is good. There is only one being that is truly good, and that is the Creator. Not me, don't call me good, he's saying. And then he asks him, very important, have you followed the commandments? Have you followed the commandments? Have you obeyed the laws of God? Have you, as we would say in Islam, have you submitted yourself to the will of God by obeying His laws? And he says, yes, I've done that since I was a young man. And he says, well, there's one more thing you have to do, and that is you must give up everything you have and follow me. قُلْ إِن كُمْتُمْ تُحِبُّنَ اللَّهِ فَتَبِيُّونِ يَحْبِبْكُمَ اللَّهِ if it is true, and Jesus would have said the same thing, as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told to say by God, as Moses would have told the Bani Israel the same thing, as every prophet would have said to his people, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the light. The only way to God is through me. Every prophet would have said that same thing to his people. We have very similar phrases in the Qur'an. The Qur'an tells us, Inna deena inda Allahil Islam, Verily, the way of life, the way of living with God is Islam. Whoever chooses a deen and a way other than Islam, it will never be accepted from them. And in the akhirah, in the afterlife, they will be of the losers. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If anybody comes to hear of me, be he a Jew or a Christian, and does not follow me, he will dwell eternally in the hellfire. So every Prophet came and said that now I am the messenger of God, you must follow me. So Jesus is saying to this young man, follow me. So Jesus expounds here, according to this tradition, to love God, to worship God alone, 
and to love for other human beings what you love for yourself. This is the summary of the law of the prophets. Not the crucifixion of a demigod or a man god or God became a man to die for the sins. No. To love God, worship Him, obey Him, follow His commandments. And of course, one has to add to that to follow Jesus because He was the prophet of that time. So this is a message, this is a message that is teaching human beings how to worship God and how to treat each other. And that was a message that came across to me as I was brought up in the monastic school, reading and studying the Bible. That was the Jesus of history. That was the man that I could imagine and envisage walking and talking and teaching. But then there was the Jesus of theology. There was the mythological and the theological Jesus. This was a Jesus that was incomprehensible to me. This was a theology that didn't seem to bear any relation to the man that I was reading about, who said some things and did some things. A theology that tells us there is one God. There is the Father who is God, and there is the Son who is God, and there is the Holy Spirit who is God. But they are not three gods, they are one God. As the Christians like to call it, a triune, a triunity. But it's all playing with words. Because whichever way we look at it, it becomes extremely complex and incomprehensible. It is in fact a mystery, and by definition a mystery is not something that we can understand. Of course the problem comes is where is the authority for this mystery? Where is this mystery explained? The whole course of the Bible that we have in our hands today, the Old Testament, is the struggle of one group of people on the face of this earth. For thousands of years of history, above all other human beings that we know, and this is why God favored them. They struggled against all the odds, against every nation, to be the people who worship the one God, who avoided all forms of idolatry, of worshiping anyone or anything else other than the one God. That they clung to obedience to the commands of God, the laws that God had revealed through which and by which they should live their lives. And in opposition to that was paganism, the worship of nature, the worship of the stars, the worship of idols, the worship of the man-gods. And of course the obedience and the submission to the kings and the priests of these idols, and the laws and the dictates of human beings. What made the children of Israel stand out above all other nations, that God favored them above all other nations, was the fact that they clung to monotheism, the worship of the one God, the true God. Elohim, Yahweh, Allah, Eli. These are some of the names they gave for God in the Hebrew language. Allah is a name for God in Hebrew and Aramaic. It is not a new God that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam invented, no. If we open any Bible in Arabic, we will find God is called Allah. We find if we read the Hebrew, if we read the Aramaic, God is called Allah. It's the Aramaic or Allah actually, Allah. So they clung to the worship of only God. For all of this time, of course some people amongst them went astray and some of them were misguided. And then God would send them another prophet and another prophet. And in fact with every generation of them, God always had a messenger to remind them and to teach them and to expound the truth to them. So they were favored in that regard. Now, I want us to think very carefully. 
about the the many different and diverse religions and beliefs that existed in the time of Jesus. And what we begin to understand is something quite remarkable. If we examine the mythologies that were prevalent at the time, of the various gods and the various pantheon of gods that people in the world worshipped at that time, we had the likes of Apollo, of Hercules, of Dionys, who were worshipped by the Greeks and the Romans. Of course, Mithra was a god that was worshipped by the Persians. Adonis and Artis were worshipped by the Babylonians, Osiris, Isis and Horus by the Egyptians, Baal, Astarte and Tammuz again by the Mesopotamians. And all of these gods had a very similar story and this is now where it becomes quite fascinating. All of these gods, if we examine the mythology, the story and the history of these gods, they all shared an almost identical and similar story. First of all, they were all called mediator, savior, healer, light bearer, deliverer. These were the common names of these gods. And their story almost always is orientated around their birth taking place on or around the 25th of September. Of a virgin in a cave. These are all human beings who are gods. So they are man gods. And often they are the son of a god. And often we find, as in, in the case of Mithra, for example, they are part of a trinity of gods. In the case of Mithra, we have Mithra, Sol Inviticus, and Saturnilius. This is a trinity of gods the Romans, in fact, invented. And it becomes very important, this particular trinity, and this particular belief the Romans had, will become very important, and we will understand it, God willing, in a minute. So all of these gods were born on or around the 25th of December. At that time, they were defeated or nearly overcome by darkness and the god of the underworld and they were taken into the underworld. But, they were reborn again. They were reborn again. And their rebirth always took place on or around Easter time. Their rebirth took place on or around Easter time. In fact, the word Easter itself comes from the name of the goddess of light, Aostra, or Astarte, or Ishtar. Ishtar, Astarte, Aostre. They are the names of goddesses, and the, name, the word Easter is actually derived from them. Sunday is named after the sun god. Tuesday, Thursday, four, after four. In fact, all of the days of the week that we know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they are named Saturday after Saturnalius. They are named after Roman gods. Sunday was the holy day of most pagans. Because all of these gods that we're talking about were derived from nature worship. And their story was all the same because the experience of human beings was very similar throughout the world. They found that on or around, and I say the world, the Western Hemisphere of course, down in Australia it works quite differently. Okay, But we're talking about the Western world here. We find why. Why is their story so, so similar? Why is their story so, so much the same? Because this is what paganism is. Paganism is the worship of nature. 
And so what happened on or around the 25th of December? Around the 25th of December, what do we have? The winter solstice. The win winter solstice is the time, is the shortest day. And for pagans who worship the sun, the sun was one of the most, the, one of the most, the, the things they worshipped and reverenced the most. So at the time of the winter solstice, they imagined that the sun was dying. That the sun was dying. In the northern hemisphere, especially up in the north, that is why, for example, they would cut down an evergreen tree. They would cut down a tree, an evergreen tree. Because everything was dying, the leaves were falling, the plants were dying, but these trees, the evergreen trees, still had life. They were still green. So they imagined, therefore, that the evergreen tree was symbolically connected to the God of life. Or it had within itself a God that kept it alive. So they would chop it down and they would place it in their homes. And they would decorate it. And underneath this idol they would place presents underneath the tree. What is now known as the Christmas pudding, that orb, I don't know if you have that sort of half orb, the Christmas pudding, and they, they well maybe the Muslims here don't know about it. And they pour over it brandy. And then they light it, and it comes ablaze. These are all connected with the pagan rituals that are supposed to return or bring back the dying sun. So the sun is dying. The sun is dying. And on the 25th of December, so the, the winter solstice is on the 22nd, but on the 25th, what happens? The sun is reborn. The days begin to get longer. The sun is reborn. And once again, the sun returns to life. So at this time, there is great celebration, great festivity, great enjoyment, because the Savior is born. Now, whether it was Artis, Mithra, Osiris, Baal, Dionys, or Jesus... It's the same, the same mythology, the same concept, paganism. How Jesus came to be mixed up in all of this, we'll see, inshallah, God willing. Now we find the story goes on. Because at Easter time, is the time of full rebirth, the time of resurrection. Again, in the Western Hemisphere, what happens is, things start coming back to life. The leaves start appearing on the trees. The, the birds start laying their eggs. The little bunny rabbits start appearing again. Okay, thus the Easter bunny, thus the Easter eggs. It is all connected to paganism. And very often we find, again, in these mystery religions, these pagan religions, this god, whether it's Mithra or Osiris or Artis or Dionys or Hercules, often they are nailed to a tree or they are bled. And their, bled, uh, and their blood and their sacrifice, which they sacrifice themselves at this time of Easter, gives life again. And through that, the people are delivered, life returns, sins are forgiven, and life is renewed. This is pagan mythology. Now, they, re they discovered in about 1903, uh, German excavators, they discovered the story of the passion of the Babylonian Baal. Baal actually is mentioned quite a bit in the Bible. Baal is one of the gods that the children of Israel, the Beni Israel, again and again they seem to keep going to the worship of this Baal. That's why what the, the, the God keeps sending prophets. Because unfortunately, very often, some of these people start going astray, they leave the pure monotheism, they leave the pure and true religion that God revealed to Moses, and they go astray. That's one of the reasons God sends prophets. And Baal is one of these false gods that they feel tempted to worship. Now they found the passion of Baal on some clay tablets. Of course, by the way, it's also no, very important to point out 
that these religions and these gods existed at the time of Jesus and thousands of years before the time of Jesus. They're not imitations of the Christian story. In fact, as we will clearly see, it's the other way round. The so-called passion of Christ is nothing except a pure imitation of the paganism of these gods and these people that they went through. It's exactly verbatim a copy of it, we will find. So we take the passion of Baal. The mystery of Baal was enacted every year in the spring. In places the Baal text incidents are so close to the gospel sequence that one might even wonder if they formed a written source. They include the details of Baal's capture and his trial in the house on the mount. His torture and being led away to death together with a malefactor. Another also charged as a malefactor was set free. The city broke out in torment and fighting. Baal's clothes were carried away. A woman wiped away the blood from the drawn out weapon thrust into his heart. A goddess sought to tend him and a weeping woman came to lament at the gate of burial. He was brought back to life at the spring equinox. Of course, the early church tried to claim these similarities is that the devil had deceived people concerning the passion of Jesus and then uh, the, the devil had made the, the whole passion of Jesus uh, similar and they had made a similar thing for their gods. However, there is a much more convincing explanation. And the more convincing explanation requires us to go back a little bit again to look at some interesting historical points. Now, in my lecture in Sydney, I tried to look at the truth about Jesus from two particular angles. I tried to look at it from the angle of examining whether the biblical text could really act as an authentic source of information about the life of Jesus. And we showed that there are several problems with that. We showed in that lecture that there are several problems with it. The contradictions within the biblical text, also the presence of large numbers of other stories of the life of Jesus that did not agree with the one that is present in the Bible. And that we also show that the present day biblical text is something that was chosen by one particular sect and one particular group and one particular mentality within Christianity. And these texts were chosen because it agreed with their idea. In fact, the gospel writers themselves confess that why did we choose these events. Why do we choose these things? As Luke, for example, confesses to Theophilus, that many people have written accounts, and many people have said different things. But I chose these things because it seemed good to me, and, and the reason why is because it testified to their concept that Jesus was the Son of God, and that, that the whole concept of Christ crucified being the essential gospel, Pauline Christianity, essentially. However, what we find is something very more interesting, which I didn't, uh, which I didn't discuss in the former lecture, and this is something, one letter, Q. Now anyone who has studied a little bit about biblical scholarship will know and understand what Q is. Q actually is short for the German word quell. And the German word quell means source. A very interesting thing happened when some biblical scholars, Protestant biblical scholars, started examining the Gospels. They found that Matthew and Luke contained a lot of parallel information. In fact, a large number of sayings were almost identical and similar. Yet this information was not in Mark. Although they generally agree that Mark in fact is the oldest of the Gospels. 
So they tried to think from where did Matthew and Luke get this information? Where were they getting this information? And they realized that Matthew and Luke must have had a common source. They must have had a common source, some bit of information, some tradition, some writings that they were both referring to. And the very interesting thing is that all the similarities between Matthew and Luke are all sayings of Jesus. This is important. It's important because there were no events described. There were no things about what Jesus did and where he went. Particularly in this common source document, there is nothing in the common source document about the crucifixion, the passion. And that, for a minute, for a, quite a while in biblical scholarship, it didn't mean anything, they didn't really think about it, until they discovered a gospel according to Thomas. They discovered the gospel of Thomas. That was a gospel that was used and has been used by the Egyptian Coptic church for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And this gospel of Thomas was also a gospel that is what they call a sayings gospel. In other words, all it contained were sayings. Jesus said this, and Jesus said that. And he said this, and he said that. Nothing about what he did. It's all about just what he said. Now that had absolutely mind-boggling and devastating implications. Because what it meant is there is a whole tradition in early Christianity to whom the death and crucifixion of Jesus meant nothing. It was not even considered to be important. What was important for them is what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. And he didn't say and didn't teach anything about the passion. He didn't say and teach anything about the crucifixion. He taught what I was talking about before. Hakik Allah, Hakik al Ibad, the rights of God, the rights of the creation. How we should worship God, how we should treat one another. It was a sayings gospel. Now that, of course, calls into question the whole presumption that Christianity from day one was this religion that believed in a Christ crucified who had come to save humanity through his death. Rather, it seems clear that early Christians considered what Christ said and what he taught about how to live really important. Whether he died and was crucified or not was almost totally irrelevant. And that means that the whole idea of God becoming a man, the whole idea of a sacrifice for the sins of humanity, the whole idea of the resurrection is unnecessary. It is not relevant to what Jesus really said and what he taught. Yet that's the whole foundation of Pauline Christianity. And that's what we generally today call Christianity. Now how did this come about? How did this come about? How did we get this fusion and confusion taking place? Well, to tell you the truth, it is almost impossible for us to come to a definite and definitive understanding how. However, as Muslims, we find the Qur'an gives us some tantalizing glimpses into how this took place. We find the Qur'an mentions some things about Jesus, about the false concepts and lies that were attributed to him, and how these things came about. For example, the Qur'an please, it please, it, it appeals to the Christian, it says to the Christians, O oh people of the book, O oh Christians and Jews, don't exaggerate. Don't go over the bounds in your religion. Don't speak about God anything except the truth. So the first hint we had, the first hint that we have is that exaggeration. Exaggeration. This is one of the ways 
that this change and this perversion and this corruption came about through exaggeration. And we have another hint. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the Muslims, do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians exaggerated in praising Jesus. I am Abdullah and I am Rasulullah. I am the worshipper of God and I am the messenger of God. So this is another clue. Don't exaggerate in praising me. So this is another clue that one of the ways this happens is an exaggeration in praising. Another thing that the Quran talks about is that in calling someone a son of God, the Quran tells us that they imitate the saying of the pagans of old. In other words, calling someone a son of God is an imitation of the language and the usage and the concepts of paganism. And so this is another thing that took place. Imitating paganism. An imitation of the ways of the pagans. So exaggeration, imitation of the disbelievers and the idol worshippers, along with that corruption of the scriptures, and along with that evil intentions of some people amongst the Jews who wanted to humiliate and defeat and be away with Jesus. Because that was one of their characteristics that we found they displayed sometimes, not all the time, but they used to, if they found a prophet came to them with something they didn't like, they would try to kill that prophet. Jesus was one of those people. He came with a message they didn't want to hear. He came telling them something, they didn't like it. So what did they try to do? They tried to kill him. Now why we will find out, there is one particular death that they wanted for Jesus, and one particular death only. And that particular death was crucifixion. And this becomes very interesting. So now if we go back and we look and we imagine. Imagine Israel. Very interesting. In fact, brothers and sisters, if you study, if you get into studying this very deeply, you will be absolutely amazed at the similarities between the condition of the Muslims today and the condition of the Muslims then. And who were the Muslims then? The Jews. They were the Muslims then. They were the believers. They were the followers of the prophets. They were the Muslims. Jesus alayhi salam, Isa ibn Marim, was a Muslim. His religion was Islam. And his followers were Muslims. And what do we find? An amazingly similar situation. Just as we find our lands are occupied by, by our enemies who want to implement the laws of disbelief, the ways of democracy, the inventions of human beings, and they are forcing us to abandon the laws of Allah. For example, the recent constitution that has been drawn up in Iraq says that the religion of Iraq is Islam, but the laws of Iraq are not going to be taken from Islam. Of course, every Muslim who understands what Islam is, knows this is just pure kufr. It's pure disbelief. Because God is the sovereign. And every Muslim has to rule according to the laws of God. And in fact, every Jew believes that too. That, we, that they should implement in that time they knew that they should implement the laws of God. And that is what they meant by the kingdom of God. For them the kingdom of God meant that the nation is ruled according to God's law. In its spirit and in its letter. Now there were some people who followed the letter but ignored the spirit. And some people who were more with the spirit of the law but they did not follow the letter. But no, in fact, the correct thing is to follow the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And it's very interesting that again, what Jesus says, as opposed to what Paul teaches, a completely different doctrine. The words of Jesus in the gospel are telling us that I have not come to change the law, 
but I've come to fulfill it. And whoever changes or leaves one dot, one dot, or one iota of the law will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. Yet Paul teaches that the law is cursed. That the law is finished. You don't need the law. You don't need to get circumcised. Be circumcised in your heart. You know, some of us, we've heard that before, right? Yes, I don't wear hijab. I wear it in my heart. I don't grow my beard. It's in my heart. And my heart's got a beard, okay? The sunnah is in my... No, seriously. You've heard some... You must have heard people say, Oh, Islam is in my heart. You've heard that before, okay? We don't need to follow the law in letter. We just need the spirit. Well, it's the same problem Jesus was facing. The same thing. There were some people who were all about following the spirit, as they called it, which actually was just an excuse to follow Greek Roman culture, to imitate the kuffar. The same problem we have, brothers and sisters. Exactly the same problem we have today. Gucci, Armani, and Christian Dwar. Right? Same problem. That we have now, they had then. I have a picture here of a synagogue. A synagogue in, in the Holy Land. Check out this picture of this synagogue. Okay, can you see it? This is the synagogue. With Roman pillars. It looks like a Roman temple. Yet that is a synagogue. So this is the influence in Palestine, in what, is, what at the time was Israel, but it was occupied of course by the Romans. The Romans were the kuffar. They worshipped Caesar as God. And wherever they went, they implemented what? The laws of God? The laws of Yahweh? No, they implemented the laws of Rome. And they collected taxes for the Roman Empire. This is what they did. And of course there were zealots. Zealots, we could translate them quite easily as Muslim fundamentalists. Okay? They were zealots, people who were zealous and jealous for the law. They believed that they should fight the Romans, throw them out of the Holy Land. This was the kingdom of God. They should not pollute the temple and pollute the Holy Land. They should be thrown out. And the law of God should be implemented in spirit and in letter. And then of course you had existing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And between them were different groups of people. For example, the high priest later was known... And he was despised by the population for being a Roman, a, a, a Roman stooge. He was a stooge of the Romans, completely doing what they wanted. Pretty much today, as we notice, there are, uh, there are many Muslim speakers, there are people who outwardly profess scholarship, yet they are doing exactly what their governments want, and often that's what the West wants. And we know it, brothers and sisters, let's not pretend. These people exist. When the hijab ban happened in France, what do we find? So-called mufti coming out and saying, Muslims in the West don't have to wear hijab. Yes. Extraordinary. So they had these people as well in that time. People who were ready, they just wanted to, everything to be nice between them and the Romans. The Romans let them keep their priesthood, their traditional Judaism, like you find today people talking about traditional Islam, which is quite often is just an excuse for their compromising mentality. It's the same study, it's fascinating. So you have these people. Now it's interesting that these zealots had different names. And one of the names they had was Nazarenes. Nazarenes. This means that they were devoted to the law. In fact, it's very interesting that we have no account of a place called Nazareth. Nazareth, as far as we know, we have no account of a town or a place called Nazareth. And of course, it might be anyone who knows the story of Jesus, okay, knows that he's supposed to be Jesus of Nazareth. But interestingly enough, when they searched for Nazareth, it exists now, but then it didn't. And it's quite extraordinary that it doesn't. But however, this term Nazarene does, a zealot for the law. And then a very interesting thing happened recently. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now this is something we could talk a lot about. But essentially what they found when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls was a community of people who were establishing obedience to God, 
the law of God and they were zealots for the law and they were ready to fight, to fight the Roman occupiers. This is what they were ready to do. And it seems that there is plenty of evidence that these in fact themselves were the early Christians. They themselves were the early Christians. And it's interesting that in these texts it talks about a liar. A man who used to be from the community and then caused a great blasphemy. And he left the community and he started calling people to a false way. And he claimed that he was following the righteous teacher, but he was not following the righteous teacher. And he had abandoned the way. And in fact, they were trying to assassinate this man. It seems as if, in fact, when we look deeper and deeper, this man is not, no one else except Paul himself. So imagine. Imagine it. Imagine it. What a better way to divert people's attention. You have this prophet, this messiah. You have this man going round, and people believe he is the anointed one, the expected one, the righteous teacher, the one who has come to liberate them, to establish the kingdom of God and the law of God. And he is teaching this message to call the people to fight against and overthrow the Romans, the pagans, and establish God's kingdom. You have the jealous priests who want to get rid of him. And you have the Romans to whom, of course, this man is a big trouble maker. There is two effective ways to deal with this problem. Number one, from the point of view of the priests, the best way to deal with this is crucify him. Why crucify him? Why not just kill him? Why not throw him over a cliff? Why not drown him? Why not something else? No, crucify particularly. And the reason is, is because... Their book says that whoever is hung upon a tree is cursed. And it's interesting that Paul mentions in the Acts of the Apostles or in one of his letters, he says the crucifixion is a stumbling block for the Jews. And in fact, even today, Jews laugh at Christians. They laugh at Christians. They laugh at Christians because they say, you say that Jesus is the Messiah. And he was crucified, and it's a big joke. You might as well roll over laughing. Because they know that God, you cannot crucify God's Messiah. Because the one who is hung on a tree is cursed. And how could God curse his chosen Messiah? It's a contradiction in terms. In fact, Paul himself tries to explain that. He says Jesus was cursed to take the curse away from us. That's his explanation. Jesus, in fact, he says, was cursed to take the curse away from us and put it onto him. That's his explanation for it. But it's very interesting. That's why they wanted him crucified. They tried to crucify him. And Allah says in the Quran that that's what they tried to do. They tried to kill him and they tried to crucify him. But Allah did not, God did not let that happen. Because Jesus is, he is the Messiah. He is the one who has come to establish the kingdom of God. And there is a fascinating thing that they discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And even Paul, he's on the road to Damascus. Why is Paul on the road to Damascus? And why does Paul go to Arabia for three years? And if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and the community, they're always talking about Damascus. Actually, every single Muslim knows the answer to that. Because where will Jesus descend? His shoulders resting on two angels in a white minaret in the east of Damascus. Every Muslim knows that Jesus is going to come again. Every Muslim knows that Jesus will come and he will fight the Antichrist who will claim that he is the Lord. And he will call people to follow his false religion. And that Jesus will defeat the Antichrist and kill him. And Jesus will break the cross and he will kill the pig. The cross is the symbol of the false religion attributed to Jesus. And the pig is the symbol of their abandonment of the law. So he will break the cross and kill the pig. And in Arabia, who was in Arabia? And what is in Arabia? Huh? That Paul, why would you think Paul might think to go to Arabia and then go to Damascus? Huh? Because Jesus told them that the prophet would come from Arabia. That the last prophet, the last messenger would come from Arabia. We know 
from the time we know from accounts of Salman al-Farsi, Salman the Persian, we know from his story that when he was within the Christians in Sham, they described exactly the bishops that he used to study with. And there were very few of them. As there few bishops left, few people following the true Christianity, the true message of Jesus. And the last one said, when he said, who am I going to study with now? Who am I going to go? He said, there's no one left. No one left following the original teachings of Jesus. But soon, a time will come when the arrival of the final prophet will shade you. And then he described exactly to Salman the Persian, the description of what this place looked like, where the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings, this final prophet would come. And he described what this prophet would be like. And of course it is in Arabia. It is in Arabia. So what we find is, first of all, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people in collusion with the Romans, and not all the Pharisees by the way, absolutely not, but I want to get into that. They wanted him crucified. That's what they wanted, at least to appear, because then they could say, he can't be your Messiah. You see, we crucified him. And then the second thing, and the very clever and cunning thing, and watch out for this brothers and sisters, is spread a false religion. Bits and pieces of the true message, but mixed up with falsehood. Mix the truth with the falsehood. So, instead of a religion that tells you, you have to implement the Sharia, you have to implement the law of God, you have to obey Allah, and we must establish Allah's law upon the earth. No. It is a religion of faith alone. That Jesus has died for your sins. That His crucifixion was a means through which and by which your sins can be atoned. And see how similar it is to the pagan religions, Mithraism, Baalism and all those other mystery cults, a, de a birth at December, a death in Easter, resurrection, blood sacrifice, something they were all very used to, something that they could easily accept. And so they exaggerated in praising Jesus, they imitated the pagans of old, and they spread this false message that came to be what we now call today Christianity. In fact, it is very interesting when we study the history. What we find is not so much that Christianity converted the world or converted the Western Europe. It's in fact more like Western Europe paganized Christianity. They made Christianity into a a mirror image of the ancient pagan cults, right down to a man-god. And there could not be a bigger blasphemy. There couldn't be a bigger contradiction to any true, obedient worshipper of God than the concept that a man is God. The concept that a man is God is the whole thing that these people have been fighting, and every Muslim has been fighting since Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, and all the prophets, including Jesus himself. The concept that God becomes a man. It is the very opposite of monotheism. And that is the very essence of paganism. This, my brothers and sisters, I hope, is a historical, insightful, thoughtful look into the passion of Jesus as who we to believe to be Isa ibn Maryam, the Messenger of Allah. And may Allah's peace and blessings be on all his messengers and his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.